Thank you all for being here. This is a great opportunity for us to be, uh, present here at Strange Loop uh, about uh, so, uh, some topics that we are really excited about that we've explored these last three months. Um, our title is The Idea is the Machine that Makes the Art That Makes the Machine that Makes the Art. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. And what that really turned into over the course of exploring this topic is um, exposing hidden layers in art preservation. And um, technical zine forthcoming. Um, shout out to Amy for running that workshop. It was a lot of fun. Oh, and we have a lot of slides, so some of it might be really fast paced. And if you have questions, um, reach out to us afterwards. Uh, first of all, uh, who are we? Um, I'm Jonathan. I do software and systems engineering for a laboratory automation company. And um, I like to say that he makes robots dance. And um, I'm a product designer and front end engineer and educator. Um, Neither of us are art historians, um, and nor do we use ML in our everyday life. So this is really um, going to be talk about our exploration um, into some of um, how we explore the data pipeline um, and um, different ML techniques, um, and finally, how this might apply to um, the artist Solowit. Um, we're also two halves of a digital practice that um, is striving to be both prompt and pleasant. Um, and we're partners in life. Yep. I should be more excited about that. I don't know why I made that face. <laughs> yes. So uh, we're uh, really excited about this talk. Uh, we've had a really exciting, enjoyable time working together. Um, in particular, these last three months, um, we've enjoyed the, the confluence of machine learning, art, and philosophy. And... Um, over the, this project, our perception of ML has changed. Um, so how did we get here? Um, this really started um, with the call for presentations at Strange Loop. Um, and we knew that we had a burning desire to collaborate together on a project outside work um, on a topic that would combine both our systems of thought um, and our different expertise. Um, so Solowit was the first person who came to mind for this talk. Um, just uh, curious. Look at the audience. Uh, how many people out there are familiar with Saul's work? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's really exciting. Oh, a treat here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've really gone down the rabbit hole of conceptual art and fallen deeply in love with Saul and his work, um, particularly with the the art practice and, and his legacy. Uh, so much so that the, our journey culminated in a trip to the Mass Mocha in uh, uh, North um, Adams. Oh yeah, sorry, North Adams, Massachusetts. Uh, to see the incredible showcase of his works on display there and get a fuller appreciation of his process. Um, <laughs> it's us. Uh, to, um, it's, it's really incredible that, that there's a, a generation-long exhibit of uh, 100 pieces of his work that's up until 2033. Um, we're, we're new admirers of Saul and his draft people's work. Yes, we're even cosplaying his wall drawings right now. So, who was Saul? Saul was an artist um, who lived from 1928 to 2007. Um, he was very prolific, um, and we find that he's a sage. There are lots of words of wisdom that will sprinkle through his talk. I mean, our talk, but maybe it's Saul's mm -hmm. because it was based off of his ideas. Um, and he's also known for um, founding two art movements. Um, early on, he his sculpture work was part of the minimalism movement. Um, and this is an example of Cube Without a Cube. Um, and later, he was involved and really a founding member of conceptualism. Um, where uh, he explored a lot of con questions of conceptual um, nature, the, such as a buried cube con containing an object of importance but little value, where he asks, hey, if you don't actually see the art, do you, is it art? Um, so this is the key quote that kicked off this project. Um, in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand, and the execution uh, is a perfunctory affair. Uh, the idea becomes a machine that makes the art. And uh, perfunctory meaning a 
from earlier is uh, minimum of effort or reflection. Mm -hmm. But what does Saul mean by this? The, the idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Uh, as we understand it, he felt that all the planning happened before you start manipulating the media, before a pencil hits paper, before a brush hits the canvas, or before fingers even hit the keys. Um, and not only was he the seminal figure in art, he was also an amazing person. And this is just one example that um, some of you may be familiar with. Um, it's his letter to Ava Hess, um, talking to her about um, how she's amazing and how to get over um, some apprehension she has with her art um, by just getting over that hump and just doing it. Um, he was extremely humble. He supported a lot of different artists um, financially and emotionally, and sometimes financially without them even knowing it. Um, and he was a staunch supporter of um, women artists as well. Um, and if you don't have time to read the letter, you can also see this rendition by Benedict Cumberbatch, which is it's kind of incredible. astonishing to yes. me. <laughs> um, so here <clears throat> is a piece that inspired this whole endeavor while drawing 797. Um, we feel that it's a perfect example of a wholly encapsulated system. Um, it contains almost all the ingredients necessary to install the work itself. Um, and what do we mean by that? Well, this is not the full title. So uh, this is. The, the full title involves actually all the instructions it takes to perform this, this piece. Um, and I'll briefly go through it. Uh, the first drafter has a black marker and makes an irregular horizontal line near the top of the wall. The second drafter tries to copy it without touching it using a red marker. The third does the same with a yellow, the fourth with a blue, and then they repeat. And um, so, so always uh, prototyped instructions like these and tweaked them until he could get predictable results. But you can kind of think of them as pseudocode for art, which is kind of um, like for conceptual art, and this is pretty incredible. So um, these simple instructions can create just an, an infinite array of beautiful generative works where the uh, interactions between the um, different drafters as well as the, the first uh, line that's, that's placed on the wall to the physical wall it's installed on have huge effects on the outcome of the, of the piece. And this core idea that, that Saul had. Um, so he, he said, I had the idea that if you can pass on the instructions from one person to another, that they can draw a line or a group of lines or different kinds of lines, arcs, et cetera. And this idea is still true. And truly anyone can do it. So <clears throat> looking at this example, um, one, the materials that Saul liked to use were fairly accessible materials, such as crayons, pencils, or markers. Um, and in some cases, India ink, which is a pretty common ink. Um, the wall drawings based off of these um, instructions um, are very site specific. So each location looks a little bit different. Um, and interestingly enough, any drawing that's made from these instructions, no matter who does it, um, in his words, is still thought to be a solo wit. So this goes back to the idea that the idea is <laughs> um, the core um, piece in that artwork. Um, Another interesting aside is that even though he felt that anyone could install these and they could be bona fide soloists, um, they couldn't be sold unless they had a certificate that is, was associated with them. Um, we couldn't find one for 797, but this one's for, for five, 541. Sorry. Um, and these um, certificates cannot be issued um, previously without Saul's consent, but now without the consent of the state. Um, and this is what it actually looks like um, in um, Virginia um, Museum. All right, so <clears throat> based off of that drawing, um, we decided to create our first prototype, um, the first part of the data pipeline for us. Um, so we created um, a <sighs> prototype with React, P5.js, and Node.js um, with the intent of using a mechanical Turk to get a lot of human input um, and have all these people together create one wall drawing um, and then put all that information into um, our model to create a very generalized um, wall drawing. And this is the result. <laughs> 
Um, our first prototype wasn't what we expected it to be, and we are sorely disappointed. But we persevered. Um, we tweaked and refined and continued to test between the two of us, um, which turned into this, which is a lot closer to what they actually look like um, in real life. Um, uh, the texture. Um, to get used to drawing with it. Um, and even as used to it, it took us about 30 minutes to complete each one. And actually, uh, our arms would get sore um, yeah. using the trackpad on our computer, which is a strange constraint. Yes, we got, um, we had to take breaks. <laughs> and we had to take mental breaks too, because it can get very repetitive mm -hmm. and in some cases boring. But then eventually, you reach this barrier where it becomes meditative again. I don't know. It, it's an it was experience. A fun process, yes. And um, but then it felt like our old pipeline was a little bit more like a pipe dream. Um, so we, we didn't even feel comfortable getting our friends to sit down and draw with us. Um, and it just didn't feel practical to use um, something like Mechanical Turk because we also wanted to pay people um, at least a living wage, and that meant 25 cents or more per minute. Um, and it also included training, and it included... Um, having to assess the hits, and if someone um, wasn't drawing the way we had expected, um, we'd have to ask them to go back to the drawing board. Um, it just, it was too much overhead. Um, so despite this grand vision of human assistance, um, the human assistance would be just us. Um, but that, it was actually a really good thing because it allowed us to make more nuanced models, which we'll revisit a little bit later. Um, and it and it turns out uh, Saul had uh, a similar idea then um, that although anybody can do uh, the kinds of lines that are very precise, only a few people can do them well, and that training is really important. And so doing individual lines uh, from a lot of different individuals may not have been the, the approach anyway. Um, so we put a uh, wall drawing 797 on the back burner for a little bit and looked at other wall drawings. Um, we collected uh, 1,300 different varieties of wall drawings, the, the text for them, um, which were uh, done in 35, or is this, no. sorry. Um, actually, we, um, Seoul has over 1,300 um, varieties of wall drawings that have been installed 3,500 times in more than 1,200 locations. Okay, so here we go. Here we get to the point where we, we thought about uh, generating new wall drawings from uh, using uh, LSTM and TensorFlow. And here's where we collected uh, a 250. roughly 250 yeah. Yeah, of the wall drawings. And uh, we started generating some fun things. Mm -hmm. And some of the results are actually pretty good, um, especially if you didn't really look too hard at them. <laughs> like number seven. Um, oh, and we used the index of, at which they were generated to give them the number, like wall and drawings kind of. His. And um, so number seven, square form vertically into four equal parts. First part on blue, white horizontal parallel lines, and in the center, irregular parallel figure random. <laughs> uh, um, some needed a bit more work. Um, I really like four star them. <laughs> it sounds like a really exciting way to four give star stars them. to a wall. Like, good job. Um, a geometric paper, I like that too. Mm -hmm. Some got a little too conceptual, even for us. That. So uh, revisiting our data set, um, we, we really wanted to, ex we just started looking at, you know, why were things a little bit, I guess, off? And um, he doesn't have a whole lot of variance in his titles. Uh, so we, it kind of was a play on trying to figure out, how do you not just completely replicate exactly what he's, what he's made and overtrain the, uh, the model? Um, and over time, he also got to the point where uh, his pieces didn't have the much instructions in them. They were just mm -hmm. things like splat. And um, there's not as much to learn off of at that point. Um, we thought that um, archive, Markov chains might be a good way to overcome this. Um, but at this point, we still felt we were straying a little bit from SolidWit, yeah. given the, uh, the drawings that were just generated. So we started looking at other ways to apply Sol, like a neural style transfer. 
Um, sure. But then you're just like, no. Like, um, given the thoughtfulness that Saul has in his work, transferring Saul's style to other works just wasn't the right way to go. Um, also, a lot of people are doing it, um, which made us think. You know, we're, we were just doing ML for ML's sake. So. So, like other things, there's a Saul quote for that. Um, he said, new materials are one of the great afflictions of contemporary art. Some artists confuse the materials with new ideas. And ML is kind of in that, in that realm. Mm -hmm. um, so, this kind of got into the, the realm for us of, uh, we started to think about like, what, what are the bounds of the power of ML, of machine learning, and what, which problems uh, is it appropriate to utilize the power of it, and where is it weak? And we thought about using ML more deeply and looked at other artists using it in a meaningful way. So our first example is Sue Gwen. Um, and she trained a neural net um, off of her previous archive of work um, and then is feeding it through um, a robot so that she can make work with it collaboratively. Um, we have Tom White who was trying to um, create um, general adversarial networks, or GANs, to fool um, ImageNet um, by creating works in real life. So he had to train these other adversarial networks to take into consideration um, how these prints would look um, as they went through the physical process of being printed, some of the, what is it called, um, misprintings, mm -hmm. um, and also how um, they might be displayed in real life. So when you look at them at different angles, they would still be able, if you took a photo of them at different angles, they would still be able to fool ImageNet into thinking um, that's a toilet. Or uh, I think my favorite is uh, the tricycle. <laughs> um, another great example in music is Holly Herndon. Um, and she and her partner are working to train an AI baby. It's about two years old. Um, and they've been training it on their own voices as well as the voices um, in their ensemble. And they feel like it's already starting to learn to talk and sing, which is really um, scary to them. Well, maybe not scary, but um, I think they're, they were a little surprised by that. Um, and recently it's credited as um, being a singer on one of their um, tracks. tracks, yes, from uh, Holly Herndon's new record. Um, and also uh, Mimo Acton. Um, so to pull from the artist's page directly, he opens with a quote, we see things not as they are, but as we are. And he describes this project, Learning to See, uh, as a, an artificial neural network looks out on the world trying to make sense of what it sees in the context of what it has seen before. It can only see what it already knows, just like us. That one's incredible. You should definitely take a look if you don't know about it. So. Uh, just thinking again, are, are we still doing uh, this work in honor of Saul, or are we doing this uh, for ourselves? Um, we are super inspired, but at the same time, like, what would Saul want to do with his work, and what would um, Saul actually do with his work? And doing a little bit more research, as we understand it, um, Saul always wanted his work to look contemporary. So that's the reason why he chose these colors and the geometric shapes, and why he tested things um, time and time again um, before he made instructions. Um, but to make it Contemporary, it also means um, reinstalling over time because these materials, as archival as they could be, um, they're still in physical spaces um, and they still um, get interacted with, um, which can cause damage to them. Um, and Saul and all of his draftspeople um, wanted generations to enjoy his work. Um, yeah. um, but the first aha moment came from this panel between um, several of Saul's assistants or drafts people um, will kind of use this term, those two terms interchangeably. Um, from that lecture, we learned that um, some of his drafts people have been with him from the start, almost 40 years. That's 40 years of knowledge. Um, and it reflects um, this thought that Saul had, which was um, that any assistant um, or craftsman or craftsperson could be very good, um, sometimes better at different tasks than the artists themselves. And um, not only have they been with him for 40 years, there have been multiple generations of assistants. Um, so on the right, left, on the left, 
Yeah. Wait, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, he's right. <laughs> You'll see um, John Hogan, who is one of his original um, assistants. And uh, as we look deeper into understanding uh, Saul's intent, uh, we found this quote where he says, art is made by human beings, not machines, which, <laughs> how do we bring that back to machine learning? So, <laughs> so yeah. And how do we honor the humans in this process? Um, so we, we thought about uh, really uh, capturing the knowledge of generations of Saul's draftspeople. Uh, the, the conceptual aspects of, in, of art um, are more difficult to model with AI and really would require a more generalized intellig uh, intelligence, which I think we'll get to uh, eventually with some models, but uh, I don't think we're there today. Um, but something that came out of this process is uh, that narrow visual and mechanical concepts can be modeled, but um, uh, such as aesthetically pleasing irregular lines or the execution of a process. Which brings us to uh, washes, um, which uh, we, we tried several different approaches with these, uh, including a CNN autoencoder, but we settled eventually on, on something called picks to picks. Um, but uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, here's what we mean by washes. So revisiting this picture, notice uh, the texture in the background of uh, the lines, uh, that th those are the washes, those blocks, of the shapes. Um, and this is a zoomed in version on another piece of the washes. <clears throat> um, and Saul's drafts people have a very specific process. Um, they use a certain brand of painted ink that was um, approved by Saul um, and it's diluted down to a certain viscosity to make it applied in a certain way and repeatable. Um, and then they apply like even washes, like washing a car over the wall. And then they do this thing to make, actually make the texture, which I really like, called Boom Boom. Um, and for each layer of color, it's three to seven layers deep. So they have like already a very replicable process. And here's what the gray um, piece looks like up close. So what are we trying to do here? Um, we, we chose to model a very small, seemingly simple problem to assist knowledge transfer between assistants thinking about the washes and how would you train an assistant in the future. Um, and we wanted to capture a model of uh, experienced drafts, drafts people to help train future and uh, help maintain knowledge across generations. So in P5, you're able to like code up something that quickly approximates the texture of these washes. Um, but um, how do you actually capture the decision-making process when um, it comes to aesthetics? So like, how would a drafts person look at this and say like, oh, this part's good, this is bad. Um, this tool wasn't necessarily made to replicate the most perfect um, model of a uh, assistant. That's hard, it's hard for anyone to describe why they like certain things and it also narrows um, um, the possibilities of that algorithm. So instead, this is what we use for the core of our data production. And then um, we allowed, well, us, um, to identify areas that to us as individuals um, looked like they needed more work. Um, and over time, um, so <clears throat> previously, this is from the UI. And then as we trained a neural net um, with lots of different washes, um, this is what the net actually described as being off for my model. Um, so it's kind of cool. It's pretty close to that bottom left um, mm -hmm. area. And so to, to make this kind of feel complete, we wanted to take it back and apply it to real washes. So we took photos of real washes and ran it on them. And um, this shows some places where we thought there were some issues, but uh, that's really a difference in aesthetic compared to the assistant since this is a final piece. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of shows that um, we're not the correct training set. Right. Um, and just to stress, this was our model, um, not us. So, um, oh, yeah. Sorry, generated this is from our... generated from our model. Mm -hmm. um, the other benefit of creating a machine learning model as compared to um, trying to code it is that um, this idea of continuous over improvement. So over time, as one gains knowledge of the washes or their own aesthetic or understanding of Saul's work, likely their assessment of the washes will change. And as you continue to feed that into the model, the model will update as well. Um, other thing is creating a perfect algorithm on the onset is 
time consuming and will likely only update every now and then, like every few decades. Um, and a model instead could learn as time goes on. So um, how do we apply this to wall drawing 797? Well, um, as described earlier, um, we had to focus more on our um, individual data sets. And it helped us think about um, machine learning in a different way. So with the mechanical trigger model, we are thinking of having lots of different assistants come together. And um, every assistant would contribute to kind of like this monolithic model. Um, all of their inputs creates different weights and combines into this like amorphous blob of a model that you see up there. But once we started thinking about um, individualized models, um, and I'm sure there's terms for this, so if you can let us know what they are after the talk, we'd love to hear them just kind of emerge as you're like, oh, how do we ML? Um, and these individualized models, like the one touched with the washes, um, helped us really figure out um, how we might apply this to Saul's assistance. So, uh, but first, uh, we we took the learning from our learnings from the washes back uh, to, into the wall drawing exploration and trained two networks, one on each of us. So this is a, a drawing generated by Christine, um, and um, the tool that Christine created there um, would show users the whole drawing, but the tool captured individual lines, and as such, we could create a mapping between subsequent lines, where, where the line on the left is the input and the right is the output. And uh, beneath the hood, as you can see from the screenshot above, we broke it into tons of component lines and generated, uh, um, trained the model on, trained a model of hers and a model of mine on, on data sets like this. Uh, like uh, with the washes, we tried some different ML approaches, but uh, ultimately landed on picks to picks again. Um, and this is the result of Chris, Christine's model, uh, completing an entire wall drawing uh, based on just one human input, which is the black line at the top. Uh, which we found really, really exciting. Um, and it even got the colors right, which I was really pumped about. Um, so, um, oh, also when putting together the output, um, I had to like multiply the lines to superimpose them. And you can kind of see like small areas um, where it shows that I overlapped, which kind of was exciting to me because it showed that the uh, algorithm is kind of learning my mistakes as well. Um, and we were super pumped by those results. But um, we also saw this quote by one of Saul's um, other um, oldest assist assistants, Joe Watanabe. Um, basically, to paraphrase, he felt that copies of Saul's work really didn't achieve the right outcome. Um, and um, that was at odds with something he said later, which was that he also, he recognizes that, but he also wants to have infinite assistants making infinite drawings in infinite locations. Um, so how do we do that? How do we bridge those two ideas? So again, we took a step back and we looked at different ways to preserve culture, such as um, New Palmyra, um, which is uh, trying to reconstruct um, buildings in Syria um, in 3D space. Um, Notre Dame, there was like, it was lucky that someone had actually captured um, the entire space um, so that people can reconstruct from it. But also thinking about artists like Sue Gwen and Holly, who are um, actively training their own models on them. Um, but how do we train a model on Saul, who's no longer with us? Um, Saul and his assistants are in this unique position where we can kind of capture the knowledge through them, because they're really the people who are inseparable from the work. Um, and they informed a lot of the technique behind Saul's work. Um, and if we're thinking about cultural preservation, um, the hope is that with well-trained models, we can prevent instances of a well-meaning restoration like this, um, which is supposed, well, it was a restoration of a priceless depiction of Christ in Spain, um, but something went awfully wrong in, in the restoration process. So uh, Saul didn't just have one assistant, he had many. And, uh, and he has many. Or he has many, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and many assistants uh, have certain specialties and unique knowledge. Um, 
So uh, we thought this is like a good time to revisit the types of models that we sort of discussed earlier, mm -hmm. the monolithic versus the individualized, mm -hmm. and do a comparative analysis. Mm -hmm. So this is our uh, joint or like um, training data that we generated, so our original drawings, um, directions. Um, mine's on the left and John's is on the right. Oh, it reflects the screen. <laughs> um, and if we look at um, mine versus John's, mine are a little bit more organic, his are more jagged. Um, my lines are closely packed, his are spaced out. When we compare models, they reflect um, the same sort of aesthetics, but they have different outputs than what we had already. Um, it's exciting because this is my model on the left and John's on the right on the same line um, as before. And, and but uh, So look at this. We actually uh, did something really fun where we got our models to collaborate together. And uh, this really blew us away. We, we like used somebody's line, then the next person's model, then alternated models all the way down. Um, and it's really fun to see uh, see the output from this, like that it actually gets the, the bands of like differences between us. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, for example, you can clearly see, um, or at least to us, um, that my lines are much closer to the previous lines, whereas John's are much further away. Um, and it kind of helps us get to the multi-assistant approach. So like imagine being able to capture Joe Watanabe's aesthetic and then John Hogan's aesthetic and future generations could kind of um, look at these models for advice. They're not necessarily meant to get prescriptive feedback on how they should make the wall drawings, but they could be a way to capture some of that knowledge um, without a lot of upfront work. Yep, uh, and it's just cool to see them work together um, a little bit against each other in a beautiful, harmonious way, just pushing and pulling uh, the, the overall output in different ways. And not all of them worked well together. Um, but I actually really like this because it's kind of like our models arguing as they try and figure out this like chaotic input that they weren't necessarily trained on. And we, it only took um, the completion of six drawings from each of us to train these models, which was a lot less than we expected. And um, these are just four um, so that you can see the detail as we compare the different approaches. On the left side are mine and on the right side are John's. And. Um Again, this is just a fun thing for us to realize. Pix to Pix is amazing. And um, we're gonna just show you a quick progression between the different applications of the models. Uh, so again, this is the source models. Um, these are our own models with our own lines. And these are our models with each other's lines. So the aesthetics kind of switched sides. Mm -hmm. And these are our models collaborating together. So um, it's it's uh, interesting to see how the um, machine learning assistants could collaborate to create like a almost stacked um, approach. Um, but in the future, perhaps um, two assistants are really good at identifying the right lines, but another one's great at that starting line. Um, you could train different models and like weight them differently and combine them later. Uh, additionally, these combinations remi reminded us of uh, how Saul liked to combine different uh, components of his work and could be something that we explore in the future to see how the different combinations would inform aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we're gonna start breezing through the rest of our slides here. Yep. <laughs> um, so although um, while drawing 797 is relatively easy to install with this marker, uh, quotes from his assistants uh, suggest otherwise, like, if our hands don't hurt, we're not doing a good job. Um, and here's like some more insight into that. Like These are very large wall drawings. Um, one of his recent installations of 100 drawings took six months with 65 assistants. Um, and there's a long process of treating the walls, prepping the space. Um, I think some people said they had to like draw like continuously, like even past the point of um, wanting to quit because it hurts so much. Um, but it's also like uh, creates this beautiful output. And it's also worth noting that this was installed after Saul's death and he never saw the outcome of it, um, which is 
Um, a testament to how much uh, he trusted in his, uh, his assistants. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought, like, to help these assistants, how might we automate this process? Um, just so future generations could enjoy Saul's work and keep things, uh, keeping things contemporary is expensive and passing knowledge might be difficult in a traditional sense. Um, so uh, although Saul believed that art is made by human beings, he also embraced uh, new technologies. Um, he, he was open to trying them. Uh, if his assistants would be still able to achieve the original intent and um, uh, they changed methodologies several times with lots of different uh, uh, forms like from string to laser levels. Um, and for us, uh, we just sort of thought, if a human generates the input, would it be reasonable to solve for a bot to execute the output? Mm -hmm. um, so we explored um, scribbles of Paper.js, um, an Arduino, and PolarGraph. And this is what we mean by scribbles, or like pretty random um, lines. Um, so we kind of generated that um, in our tool. And then this is just a more simple approach, so you can kind of see how um, those lines kind of interact with each other. Um, and we also developed this uh, plotter rig to, to test, uh, or we actually installed this, this rig to test out our concepts uh, in our apartment. Um, we, we thought it might be a, a fun thing to, as a, to use as a tool to help with uh, some of the more difficult tasks of making scribbles. A side benefit uh, is that it brings a mechanism, uh, is a, it's a mechanism to bring um, the art back into the physical world. So here's it drawing in our apartment. Ta-da. <laughs> Calibration's still a little off though. <laughs> this is supposed to be a square, but it's like a good starting point. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, so uh, can we combine the model and the robot and humans? Uh, it's like kind of where we, we want to go is our next steps. Uh, here's like kind of a... Yeah, it's an amazing rendering <laughs> of what it might look like installed on our wall. So. Uh, um, um, but we're still left with some burning questions. So how do we validate that these models actually captured us and that they captured our essence, our aesthetic and our intentions? Is there enough randomness to encapsulate the variations of us as individuals? But then on the same token, is that even necessary? So like the approach with these models is to seek advice from the past and with advice you don't necessarily need to take it. Um, and they're not a, like a necessity to the everyday practice, like these very small um, what is it, Van like vantage points into Saul's process? Oh. And the other question we have is like generations from now, at what point would an ML trained team of assistants stray very far away from Saul's initial vision? Um, but potentially you could just keep his initial um, uh, assistance models around. So uh, yeah, we'd like to kind of get there, the viewpoint of the assistants and try and understand that and see how they'd be, if they'd be interested in transferring ML knowledge. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> finally, we wanted to end on this quote. Um, I've always worked out of terror. Um, if I had a show coming up, I like, basically knew I had to do something. Um, and this is kind of like the end of our journey. Um, if you have the opportunity to present and you want to work and collaborate on something with someone you like, but also, it was also a harrowing process. <laughs> um, so you should definitely do it. It's, yeah. it's wonderful. It's, it's beautiful and uh, a little scary, but you know, transfer that terror into excitement. And mm -hmm. uh, it's an experience you'll grow a lot from. Yeah, and a shout out to conferences like Strange Loop, which kind of make it um, more accessible by covering travel and board as well. Um, and other shout outs really quickly. Uh, to uh, my dad, who helped us uh, a little bit with the printer, printing rig um, and the uh, the, um, my sister and her partner for helping us focus on this project. Um, and of course, the Saul and all his assistants um, are the core of this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.